everybody. Good morning. Um, Gus is here with me this morning, and so I figured that you guys get to wear your pajamas every week, so I was just going to go ahead and wear mine. But we are so glad that you joined us today. I hope that your week is going well. I hope that you're making the most of quarantine. You know, you, you may be working from home, but if you're not, I'm sure you're at home anyway. And I would just encourage you to, you know, make the most of this time from quarantine that um, you'll do something productive, maybe read a book. Uh, it's amazing how many people after they graduate from school don't read any more books. And so, um, you know, you can do that. You can learn a new skill. You can, if you got internet, which if you have internet, then you're watching this. So, um, but there's all these things you can learn, you know, not just random YouTube, but, you know, cook something, do something together as a family. You know, don't just stay in front of the screen the whole time. Uh, it's always great to pull away from the TV, to pull away from the computer and just connect as a family. So um, today we do want you to stay um, attached to the screen for, you know, a, probably less than an hour we're gonna have our time together and let me kind of tell you what's coming up we're gonna continue our series actually we're wrapping it up today uh, called when God and it's a video series that we've been doing with Andy Stanley this is the third week and we've talked about you know what do we do when it seems like God is inattentive uh, last week we talked about uh, how do we respond when it feels like God is uncooperative today he's gonna talk about how do we deal with those times when we feel like God is just late? And if you didn't catch last week, there was this powerful story by a couple that went through their own personal crisis several years ago when uh, their business just fell apart. And so it was really, really relevant because I think a lot of people right now are in that situation with this uh, COVID crisis of, you know, what's the business going to look like and is it going to survive? And so go back and watch that if you didn't see it we also interviewed them uh last wednesday online and so all that content is still there on facebook it's on our youtube page so um, look at it and um, share it with some friends and all that so um, we've got some music for you so like i said we're going to be here a little bit less than an hour we're going to do some music like we always do our quest band has been trying to put together some content so you can stay connected because everybody loves the music at quest and um at this time, if we were in church service, I would tell you to stand, but I'm not going to do that because you're probably sitting down and, you know, that's fine. I would probably tell you to greet the person next to you, but don't bother with that because you've been, you know, stuck with them for the last month, but be nice to them. And so, um, but here's what I want you to do is I want you to sing. Um, it might seem kind of awkward to sing in front of a computer screen or a TV screen or your phone, but, you know, just... This is church. This is going to be the reality of church for the next couple of months, I think. And so um, just make the most of it. Hopefully you're there with your family. And so um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to have our last part of When God with Andy Stanley. But right now, just enjoy the music from the Quest Band. God bless. The power of the Lord Most High. There is courage in the shadow of His wings. There is peace unending over all my life. There is freedom that washes over me. I find all I need here in Your presence, Lord. No 
love than I could fathom. God, your love for me is better than I imagined. More than I could ask or see, more than I could fathom. God, your love for me is better than I imagined. More than I could ask or see, more than I could fathom. God, your love for me is better than If you've joined us online, this would be a great uh, time to tell your friends that you're at church and they can join you at church in their pajamas. It just doesn't get any better than that. And I want to welcome all of you who decided to get up and, and put on your real clothes and come to church as well. We are um, wrapping up a series, When God, and the point of this series is to remind all of us that what we experience sometimes in terms of our frustration with God, our unanswered prayer, our feelings as if sometimes God isn't paying attention is common and that you don't have to lose faith over that. And so if what I thought would be fun today, or not fun, but to kind of get, our, get us all on the same page, is to begin with a question that all of us have asked. If you're a Christian, you've asked this. If you're not a Christian, you've asked this. If you belong to another religion, you ask this. If you're just, if you think God, you're like the Star Wars person, you think there's a force out there somewhere, you don't know how it works, you've asked this question in your, on your own terms. And the question is this, why doesn't God do something about that? Now, the interesting thing about that is you don't have to think very hard to come up with a that right now. Isn't that true? Some of you are sitting next to that, okay? It's like, right? <laughs> some of you, that is back at home, right? That, some of you work for that. Some of you work with that. Some of you, your cube is next to that. You're in a homeowner's association with that, okay? And then there's the more serious stuff, you know? There's illness, there's things going on around the world and you see it on television or you hear about it or you read a letter or you get a letter and, and it's like, God, you know, why don't you do something about that? Now, for those of you, this is your first time with us in a while or you haven't been here for the series, let me tell you what we're doing with this series. All of us have experienced times in our life when we feel like God was either inattentive, uncoordinated, cooperative or late, inattentive, uncooperative, late. So, and what, I, what we're talking about, I got to tell you, is not very emotionally satisfying. In other words, nobody leaves messages like these and goes, says, you know, I feel so much better about the junk in my life. I just really do. This isn't, a, this isn't feel better about it. This is in those dark moments when you're hanging on, when your faith is just, a, you know, a thread of a thread and you're wondering, can I believe God? Can I continue to trust in God? You just need to know that people that God loves so very much, he allowed to experience similar things to what you've experienced and he was still God and he still loved him and he still loves and cares about you. So John chapter 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. That's how the story begins. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister, Martha. So this is, this is Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, lived just a few miles from Jerusalem. And so the sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to Jesus. Jesus is about a day and a half's walk away, okay? He's not that far, but he's about a day and a half away in terms of walking. So they sent word to Jesus, and here's the word they sent. Check this out. Lord, they sent a messenger with this message. Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, how would you like to be known as the one Jesus loves? He didn't even have to say his name. 
Oh, I'm the one Jesus loves. Oh, we know who you are. In fact, this was what his name tag, this is what he used as a name tag. That's it. <laughs> if he'd had a bumper sticker, if he'd had a license plate, that's it. It's like, oh, we know you, you're Lazarus. You're the one that Jesus loves. Now, Jesus loves me, this I know for the body. You know, Jesus loves everybody. Jesus loved Mary and Martha and, and Martha and Lazarus so much that all they had to do was say, Jesus, the guy that you, we know you love him, he's sick. Story continues. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, and then Jesus creates a category for some of us, a brand new category. You ready? No, it, the sickness, is for God's glory. Sickness for God's glory? Jesus says, yeah, new category. This sickness is for God's glory. God, why is Lazarus sick? It's for my glory. Wait, wait, wait. No, sickness is a bad thing. God says, no, this sickness is for my glory. So that, purpose statement, purpose, so that God's son may be glorified through it, it being the sickness. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. I, they never told me that in Sunday school. Jesus is going, hey, th this, is, this is a new that. This is a new way of thinking. I'm about to give you light in your darkness. I'm about to give you hope where you just don't think there's any hope. Now, John, who's writing this story, realizes that this story is about to take a crazy, crazy, crazy turn. So before he tells us what happens next, John gives us a little line of commentary just to make sure we don't stop reading the story halfway through. Here's what John says. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Why are you telling us that, John? John's going, because you're not going to believe what happens next. So... So when he heard that Lazarus was, Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Wait, 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 John, you just told us that he loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Even if he didn't love Lazarus, if he loved Mary and Martha and they said, hey, will you help us out? Surely he'd go help them out. Even if he didn't love Mary and Martha and he just loved Lazarus, surely when he finds out Lazarus is sick, he's gonna get up and go to him. Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, after two days. In other words, the disciples are there. The messenger shows up, says, hey, Jesus, the one you love is sick. Mary and Martha, I want you to come help them out. The disciples all get up like, well, I guess we're going to Bethany. Jesus says, have a seat. We're not going anywhere. Oh, then two days later, two days later, he says, hey, let's go back to Judea. Let's head back toward Bethany. But rabbi, they said, the disciples said, but rabbi, they said, a short while ago, you may not remember this, we remember it vividly. The Jews, were tr the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Implication, Jesus. You see, when the Jews try to stone you, sometimes they miss and hit us, okay? So we don't really want to go back toward Bethany or to Judea because the Jews are waiting on you. This was the Jewish leaders that wanted to get rid of Jesus. And so they weren't concerned about Jesus. I mean, if you're following a guy who's being stoned, you're going to get hit. And they just didn't want to go. So they're trying to act like they're protecting Jesus. Oh, I don't think it's good for you. Um, are you sure that we should go back? And then Jesus answered and said, and Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Huh? Weren't we just talking about Judea and getting stoned and not going? And this probably has to do with Lazarus. And Jesus goes, yeah. Aren't there 12 hours of daylight? Yeah, what are we talking about? Okay, and this is what Jesus would do. And so in this moment, it's so brilliant. Jesus does a little teaching and they have no idea what he's talking about. John's like, just write it down. Shh, just write it down because it will be important <laughs> later, I'm sure. Okay, John writes it down. And when you get to the end of the story and you go back and look at the story and when you read the whole book of John, it's evident what Jesus is saying to them. Let me read you what he says. He says, aren't there 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk in the daytime will not stumble for they see by this world's light. They're going, uh-huh. It is when people walk at night that they stumble for they have no light. That's profound. What are you talking about? I okay, know this is so important, okay? Jesus, when he says there's 12 hours of daylight, what he's talking about is opportunity. That every half a day when the sun's up, there's an opportunity to do things. But when the sun goes down, you lose your opportunity. And Jesus is saying to them, this is so powerful. He's saying, guys, you can stay here if you want. But I'm not going to be here very long. Eventually, I'm leaving this earth. And when I leave this earth, a light goes out. Psst, and you're back in darkness. And so you need to learn all you can. And guys, if you follow me to Bethany, if you follow me to Judea, I'm about to give you a candle 
that you will carry with you the rest of your life through the darkness of this life because I'm about to introduce you to something that you won't learn any other way. So let's go to Judea. After he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. So the disciples replied, because they don't want to go, and they now are going to give Jesus medical um, information or medical advice. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. The fever's broken. He's fine. We don't need to go to Judea. Lord, if he's asleep, he's doing fine. You've given God medical advice before, haven't you? God, all you have to do is this. All you have to do is that. God, if you can get us to the right doctor, you've given your doctor's medical advice. So they're like, and, and their concern isn't Lazarus. They just don't want to, you know, face getting stoned. Jesus had been speaking of his death, Lazarus' death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then Jesus tells them plainly. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then Jesus makes what is possibly the most insensitive statement in the entire Bible. And Jesus turns to his closest followers and he says, he is dead and for your sake, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there. Wait a minute. You knew he was going to die? Yeah. Wait a minute. You let Mary and Martha nurse their brother till he dies and you knew he was going to die and you didn't go on purpose? Yeah. And you're glad we weren't there to save the one you love? Okay, uh, Jesus, I, I know you're into big you know, illustrations. What could be so important for us to learn? What could be so important? What could be so important to you that you would allow the one that you love to die? So that, purpose statement, you may believe, but let us go to him. Well, Jesus, Jesus, okay. So it is so valuable to you that we believe in you, that you would allow someone to die to bring us to full grown-up faith in you? Yeah, it's that important to me. That's a new category, isn't it? Wait a minute, that, that, I mean, that just wrecks our theology for some of us, doesn't it? Jesus created a that so we could understand what God is doing when God doesn't do that thing that we think God ought to do. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus dead. Then Thomas, and this is really kind of funny. Do you remember um, um, Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore? Remember Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh? It's like, uh, it's all gonna be bad, okay? Well, you have one of those in your family. If you have more than three kids, one of your kids is an Eeyore, right? You may have married Eeyore. Everything's negative, everything's bad. Your dad was Eeyore, okay? So Jesus had one of these in his group of disciples. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, this is so funny, let us go that we may die with him. Lazarus is dead. The Jews are going to stone Jesus and they're going to stone us. It's going to be a massive funeral. Let's just all go. Let's just go to Judea and let's just all die with Lazarus. Let us go with him that we may all die with him. Isn't that great? Read your Bible. Then, he, then he, this is what happens, okay? It goes on. Now, on his arrival, Jesus, had, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, here is where I, we, we got to pause and understand the drama of this moment, okay? Because see, back in Bethany, Lazarus is dying without morphine. Lazarus is dying without drugs. Lazarus is dying without any external aid. They don't even know what he's dying of. And they sent, message, they sent a message to Jesus, and you know what happened. Okay, you can guess because you, you have your own version of this. Mary and Martha, you know, they're kneeling down beside Lazarus, wiping the sweat off his brow, going, don't worry, we sent for Jesus. Don't worry, we sent for Jesus. You don't have to worry. Jesus is on his way. We got word to Jesus. The messenger came back and said he delivered the message to Jesus, and he saw the disciples. They'll be here. They'll be here. And they waited, and they waited, and the community waited, and the community watched. And then Lazarus died. And so they watched, or maybe they participated in wrapping him, much like they would wrap Jesus not too long after this and put him in a tomb and rolled the stone in front of it and probably sealed it and began to mourn. 
and know Jesus. Isn't that where we live sometimes? Isn't that that inattentive, you know, uninterested, disinterested, late, I thought you cared about me, God? And Jesus created this, that, so that we could carry hope into our futures. That's how important this lesson was to your Savior and to mine. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. Four days is important. In the first century, they believed that the spirit of a person hovered over the dead body for three days. And when the face began to change because of uh, just what happens when a body lays exposed, um, exposed to light and exposed to air, as the face begins to change, they believed in three days that the spirit would leave that there would be no hope. The spirit would look at the body and realize, I can't re-inhabit that body and leave. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she left the house, went to the edge of town to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Now, let me ask you something. Just, we're just guessing. Why do you think Mary stayed at home? Lazarus is dead. He's buried. Why wouldn't Mary rush out to see Jesus? What is she feeling? Come on. What is she feeling? She's mad. I mean, what do you do with those emotions? You could have, you should have, I would have, you didn't. We gave you every opportunity. You you don't love us. You love strangers, you love Romans, you love Gentiles more than your own people. Martha ran out when she saw him. Mary stayed at home. And when Martha got there, she fell at his feet and she said this. If you had been here, this is what you say, this is what I say. If you had been here, if you'd heard my prayer, if you'd shown up, my brother would not have died. This is your fault. This is your doing. Next screen. But I know, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And listen to Jesus' response. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. This is that moment when people try to comfort you and say, he's in a better place. She's in a better place. You'll see him again. You'll see. And so, so Martha thinks Jesus is going into the theological thing. Like, don't worry, you'll see him again. And na, 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 na. She's like, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I, don't, don't, give me, don't give me a theology lesson. I know we're all going to be resurrected. We're all going to be in heaven. I don't, don't, but you, you should have been here. And then Jesus Jesus looks at her in the eye. This is so dramatic. Jesus looks at her in the eye and says something only a crazy person would say, or, e- or, or only an imposter would say, or perhaps the Son of God would say. And he looks at this angry, confused, you know, emotional woman who loved her brother and thought she knew who Jesus was. And he says to her what he says to you. And he says to me, and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha, Martha, you think resurrection is an event, and it is. You think resurrection is about the future, and it is. Martha, I am, I am resurrection and life. Who would say that to a woman who just lost her brother? Jesus did. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, they will live. Even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asked her a question that I think he asked each one of you. I think he asked a question that he asked me. He asked a question that will mean different things to different ones of us at different stages of our life. He asked a question that was easy to believe when you were six years old. It's a question that was easy to believe when you were 12 years old, but it got a little bit more difficult to believe when you were 22 years old or you're 35 years old, or you're about to bury somebody you love, or you're watching someone you love suffer, or you just went through the most difficult period of your life. And he looks at her in the eyes and he asks this question. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Martha, even with all you've just experienced, knowing I could have kept this from happening, do you still trust me? Do you still believe that I'm who you thought I was even though I have not acted like you thought I would act based on who you thought I was? 
Yes, Lord, she said. She told him. I believe that you are, and then she just kind of goes into her own little theological thing because she doesn't know what to believe. I, I, I believe, I, I didn't follow the whole resurrection in life, and if you're dead, you're not gonna, I, I didn't follow all that, but I, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who was to come into the world. Then she runs back and she says, Mary, you gotta go see the master before he gets into town. And so, Mary runs out there and she has basically the identical conversation with Jesus. Why didn't you get here? You could have stopped this. And John tells us that when he saw her emotion, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And then he said, asked this question that he probably knew the answer to. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, they replied. And either on the way or once he arrived at the tomb, John records for us something that's astounding. He, he records something for us that, that helps us understand that when you're going through the most difficult time of your life, even though God could have, would have, and should have, when he chooses not to, it's not because he's distant, that God has the ability to enter into your pain, your deepest pain, even when he chooses to do nothing about it. And Jesus paused, knowing exactly what was about to transpire, knowing exactly how this story would end. But I think for your sake and for my sake, John says that Jesus wept. It's as, it's as if he said, I, I, I'm not too big to understand. I'm not too distant and I'm not too almighty to understand. That when you suffer and when you hurt and when you don't understand and when you feel abandoned by God, it's as if God leans into your world and he says, I know. I know. Then the Jews said what we would say. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Even he is standing outside this tomb mourning the loss of his friend. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Why didn't he do something about that? And then Jesus, once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And then he said, take away the stone. He said, now they weren't expecting this. They were already confused, but Lazarus was dead, like he was completely dead, already dead. He was gone. He was dead. They would see him someday, maybe someday, in some resurrection that no one understood. And Jesus says, I want you to remove the tomb. But Lord said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there is a bad odor. Now she's gonna give Jesus a different kind of lesson, okay? There is a bad odor for he has been there and I think she was twisting the knife. Four days, okay? You didn't show up right after the funeral. Four days. Oh, you thought we just put him in there. Four days he has been in the tomb. And Jesus said, and I love this, I love this. And Jesus said to her, and I think he says to you, and he says to me, did I not tell you that if you believe, that is, if you trust me, that if you place your weight on me, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the, there's that word again, the glory of God. Okay. Jesus, seriously, so this whole thing is about you? This whole thing is about your glory? This whole thing is about whether or not we believe? This whole thing is about whether or not we can trust you when that thing that we think should be changed doesn't get changed? This is what the whole thing's about? In other words, you let your friend die so that we would learn something about your glory? He said, I told you, if you keep your eyes open, if you continue to trust me, if you continue to believe, if you continue to put one step in front of the other, if you continue to live your life as if I'm who I say I am, you will catch a glimpse of my glory even in your most difficult time. So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, I love this part too. Let me tell you what he says before I read you the prayer. Jesus basically has a prayer that goes something like this. God, you and I know what's going on. We know what's about to happen. They don't. So I want them to see me talking to you. 
So when this happens, they don't go, oh, Jesus. They go, oh, Jesus and God, because this is all really about you, and I'm just here to reflect you, and I'm about to reflect you in a big way, aren't I? So here we go. Have they all seen me praying? They have. Okay, then let's get on with this. <laughs> I love this. Listen to how Jesus prayed this. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. This is about me so that they see you. And Jesus, you're telling us it was worth all of this drama and this pain and this, this emotion for people to understand your connection with God and to learn something about God. And Jesus would say, yes, I think it was worth that. And when he had said this, he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Do you know why Jesus had to say, take off the grave clothes and let him go? Because nobody was making a move toward Lazarus. It's like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Oh, you are kidding me. They are all just standing there. And of course, Jesus has this big smile on his face and he's going, somebody go. It's like, ah, he is alive. Therefore, this is an understatement. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. I bet they did. <laughs> I bet everybody in the town put their faith in him. Everybody in the vicinity. And this story spread like wildfire. He didn't just heal somebody and raise somebody from the dead who may have been asleep, may have been unconscious, may have just, you know, just pa passed out. We couldn't find their pulse. This guy had been in the tomb for four days. There is nothing, nothing, nothing nothing he can't do. So here's the question. Why doesn't God do something about that? Why doesn't God do something about that? And the answer is we don't know sometimes. But here's what we do know. Because of a day in Bethany with Jesus and some people he loved. We know that he can. And we know sometimes he waits. And we know we can trust him in the meantime. Why doesn't God do something about that? I don't know, but I know he can. And I know that sometimes he waits and I know that I can trust him in the meantime. Why doesn't God do something about that? I don't know, but I know that he can. And I know that sometimes he waits and I know that I can trust him in the meantime. And I know I can trust him in the meantime because he made me this promise. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. If you believe, if you continue to trust, if you continue to maintain hope, if you continue to maintain focus in the midst of the worst of the worst, in the midst of a that that you have no explanation for, that God is able and God is willing to leverage that for his glory and for the glory of his son and for your good if you continue to trust him. See, it's not emotionally satisfying but it's the thing that God has given us to hang on to. We know that he could do something about that. We know that sometimes he waits and we know that we can believe in the meantime. And that would be their message after Jesus left this planet. It has been the hope and it's been the message of the church ever since. And if you continue to believe and continue to trust, you will, you may, you will probably catch a glimpse of the glory of God in the midst of that Thing that you are absolutely convinced God should do something about. Wow. So when God is inattentive, you look outside your circumstances at the things that God is doing outside of your world, like John the Baptist did. And when God is uncooperative, you lean into his grace because Paul told us that his grace will be sufficient for you even in those circumstances that never change. And when you feel like God is late, you look for his glory. Because if you believe, if you continue to trust, you will eventually see the glory, the glory, the glory of God. Heavenly Father, thank you very, very much for preserving this remarkable story in all of this detail. Father, thank you for your son, 
who, and, and it's hard to us, uh, for us to fathom, who allowed those he loved to experience what they experienced so that all these years later we can maintain hope, that we can maintain faith, that we can maintain trust. And Father, I pray for the high school student. I pray for the single adult. I pray for the struggling marriage, for the man or woman who's watching someone they love suffer and they've prayed and prayed and prayed, Father. Whatever the, that is for us, whatever that thing is that we're saying, why doesn't God do something about that? I pray that today we would leave here with the confidence that you could, that sometimes you wait, and we can believe in the meantime. And that if you would be so gracious, we could catch a glimpse of your glory in the midst of that thing that we wish like crazy, you would change. So I pray that you would give us the courage to respond to what we've heard today in a way that honors and glorifies you. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' amazing name. Amen.
but what an incredible series this has been that you know when God is inattentive we need to look beyond our present surroundings and our circumstances when God is uncooperative look for his grace and when God is seems to be late in addressing your problems or in answering your prayers it can be difficult for us to know how to continue on with our faith but this story that we looked at today of Lazarus being raised from the dead offers us hope in the midst of a situation that uh, that can seem hopeless and if you just trust God through it and do the right thing then he will eventually show you his glory so thanks for joining us uh, spending this time online we hope that you were blessed by the music and the message feel free to share this content with your friends it's online the whole week um, so we have it live but then it's still available on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel uh, Quest Cebu uh, don't forget that Wednesdays we have our time of prayer and reflection at 9 p.m. that you can be with us as we spend some time together there uh, Sunday mornings, 9 o'clock, is Quest Online for Kids. And then Sunday morning, we always do this at 11 o'clock here online. And so next week, I'm starting a new series that I think is going to be super helpful for all of us uh, in this unique time that we're all at home together, spending more time, creating unique challenges and, and difficulties. And so I think this is going to help us all out. So have a great week. Thanks again for being here. Uh, as always, be careful, stay safe, wash your hands, wear your mask, social distance, and more than that, and along with that, is know that we love you and we're praying for you and have a great week. God bless.